Hello everyone, today we talk about the collimation of Indo-European mythology, Clausewitz in theory, and I would say evolutionary biology in a sense, uh, but this could take even a broader meaning, right? You know, yesterday we were talking about the pursuit of meaning, kind of criticizing the still positive work of Jordan Peterson. And I think, you know, some of you may may actually say, what? Why do you even talk about this stuff? Someone say, you know, it's too political or whatever. Well, I have made videos in this terrain playlist that explain how, you know, politics is connected to history. If I have a Clausewitzian um, background and my avatar is the same, the same author, the von Krieger, you cannot actually say, you know, talk history and, you know, this is not political in some ways. You know, I'm not a political activist in the sense that I don't take any um uh, side of a, of a specific party or a specific political figure or say you should vote this or that i never did it i don't care i don't think that is related to the channel but the entire point of history is to understand politics i'm a military historian if, if war is just a continuation of politics with other means should connect the dots and um i understand however the the sense of disorientation, especially for the reasons that I lament in general <laughs> regarding to the misunderstanding of my content. And also understanding, of course, that um, we all get through that, um, you know, to, to that point, well past, um, uh, by that point of the road when you think that fundamentally politics and history have nothing to do with each other, they must not have anything to do with each other. That unfortunately corresponds to a just you know, simplistic view of reality and actually even to some important political issues that sometimes we have, uh, including not recognizing how much our thoughts are political and, you know, feeling the need to hide it behind the, you know, uh, in fact, names such as history, whatever, without properly even understanding what that, uh, th the connection that exists with that. And I've already hinted at today's topic in some of my videos. I've started making special videos about Indo-European mythology. As you know, and probably some of you think that I'm mm, turning crazy or something, that I'm fixated with this stuff. As you know, in my videos I don't um, um, really indulge into, like, I never say this is Indo-European stuff, hence it's a, you know, monolithic block, it just pertains to Indo-Europeans, uh, you know, cheering, you know, uh, you know uh, whiteness or per se for the sake of it or anything. This, these are just, um, you know, things that we know in the first place because of the very, very lucky, um, you know, coincidence, historical coincidence that we had in, in the West, in Europe especially, regarding our capacity of properly knowing the mythology of such peoples, the fact that there were somewhat militarized in nature and that therefore, in my opinion, and this is what I've explained today, but I think it, it's the correct explanation as a matter of fact, in fact, un, un, under the light of, of Clausewitz in theory and more, um, that uh, were essentially more loaded in moral strength in some measure that, you know, it's something you can't say about other peoples who were out there, were still warlike, etc., but that for some reason that I honestly still haven't um, you know, for some contingency that I honestly still haven't uh, measured per se, because it's very complex. Also, we're talking about prehistorical times, meaning that we know mythology, uh, meaning that we, we know when, when these things were written down, because we know they existed before, and that, that we, we read them as a trace of what was before, um, through, I don't know, we know it through some through the Iliad or the Odyssey or through the Roman sagas or later on through the, the Norse sagas and so in a moment in which in fact these sagas were actually written down so in times that did not properly pertain to the moment of uh, of making of Indo-Europeans there are some is some historiographical, historiographical currents that even deny the existence of what we call in the European peoples, they say, ah, oh, this is a threat, because if you think like that, you're like a Nazi, you believe these were Aryans, pure race, whatever. Actually, there is no need to, to be that hysterical about that. You know, we all know how cultures and peoples form and how, um, you know, fluid the boundaries of it 
is the same name Aryan that it seems to be, you know, like uh, a forbidden word. Actually, is 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 a pretty generic term that stresses the nobility. And so, if anything, a spiritual race, not a you know quite a genetic one, um, that gave the name properly to Indo-Europeans. So um, there's a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of kids today that are brought up, you know essentially being scared of things without even understanding what they mean, right? Which is exactly, by the way, the, the, the reverse opposite of what Indo-Europeans and many other peoples, and most other peoples actually in the world at this, that stage of development actually believed. And um, so the, the idea of the pursuit of meaning that yesterday I was addressing is like, you know, these peoples actually found out through sheer experience and terrible, you know, uh, lifetimes, and uh, and uh, you know th this constant struggle fundamentally they they, w they were framed within inescapably um, the relation between our mind reality uh, purpose etc and um, fundamentally this uh, this worldview this this mindset this this valorial system has been uh, forgotten right in great part by modernization and secularism and um, to the point that even th those who make political activism against uh, what they think tradition is, that is something that basically not even conservatives actually understand anymore. In fact, do not even know these things e existed, like right? they've never properly read and studied things like in the European mythology and so on. There is a f I'm not an expert even on these things, as you know, I, I never studied Indo-Europeistics, mm, uh, at, uh, at least formally speaking. I have many books about it read, keep reading them, we'll keep talking about this thing. There is, for example, um, I, 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 don't, I can't even understand how somebody can deny the existence of uh, in Indo-European peoples when we have literally an Indo-European language that we can draw from that is associated also etymologically to, to a very s specific and, you know, clear uh, system of, of meanings, of understanding um, of, of the world, of, of astronomy, etc., that, that is basically the same languages that we're, we are speaking today with all the semantics that, again, we have kind of lost um, meaning uh, knowledge of, right, you know, understanding of, but that we still feel emotionally actually when we speak. This is something terrifying when we actually understand that your language is not just, you know, a, uh, an empty code that at some point randomly developed, but it, it has a very specific meaning in, in the consonants, in the vowels, in all the phonetics, and that this is essentially still giving you, when you speak, when you pronounce this automatically, those kind of feelings that you associate semantically to those values, to these symbols, etc., and you don't, you didn't even know because nobody ever told you when you went to school that this was the case. I can assure you it's mind blowing. We'll talk more about this. And I I got thoroughly interested in this not much because I'm myself a, a European or anything. It's just that I um, believe that um, in uh, in Western history for again, somewhat contingental reasons, we had this enormous lack, as I was saying before, being able to document this transition, this historical development. And when we teach history, fundamentally, we don't, we normally don't even address the problem, right? Indo-Europeistics is mostly the field of uh, linguists, uh, of, uh, I, I suppose, marginally anthropologists, surely historians of religions, but in in um, environments that, as I was saying in the video I made before yesterday, that have been heavily ideologized, especially after World War II, in a structuralist, hence anti-idealist, hence unavoidably anti-Indo-European sense. Uh, I studied myself on, on the same books that are meant to explain these the religions, and actually they do not address anything of the, the ultimate meaning that is to be found in the Ravenna, in the sagas, in every, everywhere you can uh, connect the dots, even in there, that, that is um, like, uh, like it, this, th this stuff is, it's not that has ever been debunked or has ever passed, uh, it's been, um, you know, corrected and, uh, you know, it, it eliminated because it doesn't work. It's still there, right? It's just that the academic interest shifted towards another direction and forgot the stuff that is still there. I mean, people writing a uh, couple of generations ago that knew all, all about it, it's all public, it's all, it's not a mystery, it's not a secret, it's not a conspiracy theory, it has nothing to do with 
I don't know, national socialism or fascism or, uh, or whatever. It's sure that at the time, in historical times, of course, uh, this stuff was revived because also people from a certain political background, so like all scholars are, like today, like uh, at the time, were more uh, oriented towards that, they were more oriented towards idealism, they were more oriented towards ethno-nationalism, or even war sometimes. But when, you know, you, you talk to an historian of religion all over the world about names like Dumezil, for example, or uh, like, you know, that is the cornerstone of the world studies, you cannot escape that, it's just you have to learn about him and his work because you can't go anywhere without that knowledge. And um, and this um, kind of furious iconoclasm that has taken place after World War II, frankly, is is healthy as much as we can, of course, escape the the uh, dogmatic categories that uh, statalism and nationalism have actually in an anti-traditional and anti-European sense, which was a a, a, a militistic. Um, um, uh, ideology in fact it didn't have anything to do with the rise of the masses that happened in the, in the 18th and the 19th century and that has ruined everything to the point in fact as we've seen before the north the left or the right knows anything about this stuff anymore because they simply swallowed it in their own in their own in the ocean of their own ignorance um accomplice of course did dramatically you know, easy life that we've been living in this point to the point that we don't even need to think like, um, you know, what what the problem is. But actually, these are universal problems, right? Are still, you know, there are, are ideas that are not bypassable, are not just you know a phase of history that you know for some odd reason people believed, like a very pushed modernistic and secularistic interpretation of history would like to make you believe this kind of sort of. Um, um, aseptic view of history for which everything that counted was just, you know, uh, technology and, uh, you know, socio-economical matters and, you know, as if history was not instead the, the, the explosion essentially of enormous moral forces was just, they were just influencing each other and uh, loaded in beliefs that ultimately were understood given their greatness in a universal sense, right? So these are I, values and ideas that are, do not pertain just per se to Indo-Europeans or any, they are to be found in many other religions actually, even across continents or across oceans for that matter, say Native Americans actually had something pretty close to that, and again, it's, it's, not, uh, a diff uh, it's not a culturalist difference, um, it's really, and unfortunately military history today is dominated by culturalism, just to, to tell you how, you know, dramatically, um, you know, useless it is, and, and that's the reason why people fr fundamentally don't know anything about war nor can understand it um, um, in, in practical terms anymore. Uh, it's the same reason, right? They culminate in the measure in which it's not a cultural difference, right? It's essentially a different degree of m moral intensity that fundamentally pushes through the same human beings that as we are everywhere, right? So this is also, of course, in an anti-racist idea. As as a matter of fact, culturalism is racist uh, because it doesn't give any other explanation but that, you know, there are cultural differences for some reason that is intrinsic to that, you know, people as a world that is somewhat for some reason either, you know, more or less violent than another. But this has absolutely nothing to do, in fact, with, with what we understand violence to be from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, a genetic one, and so on. And um, and so that's why I care so much about this topic to be laid out. Um, this, uh, uh, let's say, coincidence, uh, collimation, well, call it whatever you like, superimposition, of the um, Indo-European mythology and the purpose of life, fundamentally, and you know, from an ethical point of view, and so also in the action, um, to... Uh, is um, with the Clausewitzian theory, the coincidence with it, um, is something that I discovered randomly, uh, as I was saying also a couple of videos ago, just by studying von Clausewitz first and recovering a great deal of idealism over uh, materialism that are both needed to understand the world, but you know, not to radicalizing just with one or, or, or the other. And idealism is more important, as I always say, just because, again, uh, even if, you know, matter worked 
you know move by itself like it can do in a universe creating problems to you at the end of the day it's it's not alive and you are the only one who can do something about that right it's not a guarantee of a victory but still you are the a the moral agent about which we don't properly understand even the 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 existence right the biology of it because nobody has the palest idea where life comes from it's just speculation and the way also how these problems and how the just the mechanicism of it is you know being stressed as what you should know why not realizing that fundamentally you're if anything by existential reasons you're just using your brain without and succeeding in stuff without even needing to know how your brain mechanically works uh, is a big deal right that uh, is exactly what these uh, mythologies were were stressing right it's a normal human condition the same deal with with religion even with with the judeo-christian tradition it's basically the same understanding of the existential condition that again heavy modernism and secularism have said no this stuff is not because you know since you cannot demonstrate um it on a you know uh, mechanical level i'm not even saying an empirical one right uh because to uh, you, you it's worthless right these people reason like this because of course they don't understand that the greatest evidence that we have is history is civilizational development so you don't need to know how you know mechanically this works in somebody's brain to understand that you know macroscopically that humans all behave in a certain way that uh, communities develop in a certain way that civilization has a universal value that these meanings are needed to boost civilization right so this is also one of the consequences of the radical uh, materialism that has taken over after you know with marxism from the 60s the 70s and so on and that is simply the denial of humanity right as basically the, the core of the marxist ideology gets down to right to, to achieve complete equality by emptying the individual of any value because otherwise no equality equality can never be achieved just this is a elementary physical understanding so it's also of course an anti-scientific um, idea but it's um it's also like criminal if, from a moral point of view and of course if you de devo deplete a person from any kind of uh, you, you say empty person of any kind of, of knowledge of a, that as we will see now is crucial to to be you know to be a successful human being you can easily achieve um equality in nothingness right which is exactly what the, the radical ideologies we're assisting to today is are, are actually pushing right this is most evident in the left and uh, i don't need even to explain how and why because it's the most prominent stuff you find everywhere but this is this actually also applies to the extreme right in the measure in which you know com communism wants to make you believe that fundamentally communities exist with with no paradoxically with no past even though there is a tradition that is because they, they need to stress that it's immutable right that, that this is not earned this is not built up this is not stratified this is not changing and this it, this doesn't change right just takes for you to be born so in somewhere so to do basically nothing to be a complete nothingness but just because you are part of that group you you should feel special and that instead just the same level of emptying and flattening that doesn't uh, that refuses even to explain history and that's why so also so many kids from the other side are buying to that and the, the there couldn't be an extreme left if there was an extreme right like that right there they're simply the the different uh, on our horizontal plan the different extremes of the same level of inferiority instead indo-european um mythology also because of its in theory etc speaks of an elevation right that naturally these people cannot achieve uh with this mindset so um it's um how did they discover this uh overlapping as i was saying before i i studied von clausewitz first and i understood the importance of course of moral forces in in war that per se is the uh human activity that basically um has the great the uh, the the highest degree of unpredictability with the highest degree in fact of of um of pressure mm -hmm. that humans can't control right so basically it's the single most important human activity in terms of uh, you know what he basically provides you with through um, you know in terms of scientific understanding right through wage and through studying it 
And this is also a great part of the reason why war is not being studied anymore, because in a sense it's difficult. Um, and in another way, people are not willing to make these efforts anymore, in part due to hyper-specialization, in part due to, in fact, the dumbification of thought, right? We are losing in IQ, this is official, right? It's been seen, like, the, basically, the, the, last, the very last generations are regressing in IQ compared to the ones of their predecessors that were not really special humans for that matter. Um, the average has always been terribly mediocre to say, to make a compliment actually, to say the least. But um, the, um, uh, the, the thing is regressing once again. So the hope even to have a systemic understanding of something like war um, or much, you know, even, you know, other issues, let's say, in, in, the, in the qualitative level of understanding all that is, um, is regressing, right? And so this is also a particular danger that we could digress on again, but not for today. So a war in this regard uh, appeared to me uh, central uh, in, the, in the human experience because, as you know, in Clausewitzian theory, there is a great, great deal of psychological analysis as well of some sort. I mean, von Clausewitz at some point makes uh, an example of what is the not just the best mind, right, in terms of, uh, you know, fitness for command, but also what are the other human types fundamentally and why they are, it's a complex thing, it's not just like a personality test, it's just, it's an overlapping, of course, um, it's a serious thing, in fact, um, that shows you how, of course, different um, qualities can coexist in this regard, how people can also cultivate sound them. And especially war is a uh, great, not just testing, but also teaching ground of this matter. And how, in this sense, war is violence, and um, violence is basically the, the enactment of, the physical enactment of this struggle, for stemming from the inherent conflict that exists within humanity. So conflicts between humanity exist just from an evolutionary point of view because there is no such thing like a conflict, meaning, you know, th those people who think that uh, humans could live in harmony and peace are really cute, but unfortunately are also one of the greatest reasons why, unfortunately, too many conflicts are breaking out. Again, because they don't realize that conflict, uh, whether with other humans or with, with the physical world, and very often do two things, are, if not always, actually are intertwined, is actually the, um, let's say, the, re the, the normal response that our evolution built in our genes in order to cope with anything, right? It's the same reason why you, you get angry when you, you have a need that you cannot satisfy, right? And, and that pushes you to, to, to try to fix the thing, to improve and to get the satisfaction and having it done, right? It's tiring can be stressful, you may never know at the end whether it was worth it or not, but basically this is the way we do things. Uh, whether if we need a glass of water or if we want to, you know, to, to, to go after our crash or if we want to, you know, uh, to stabilize a re uh, political situation in, on a regional scale or things like these. So um, naturally this has both this starts from the individual but it gets collective and interestingly enough um, of course war is is this collective um, effort at the end of the day that assumes certain characteristics of course in the in the physical reality in, in reality just that are different say from the one of the individual because it adds the interaction between individuals but that are that is not essentially different as von Clausewitz says from the um, at some point he says war is nothing but a duel on a, on a large scale, right? And that's a very powerful line because everybody can relate to a duel, right? To an enmity, to a struggle between a person and another. And so if you if you understand what can be the motivations for, for an individual, right? You can understand immediately what can be, I don't know, for a state, for example, and how, you know, maybe just people exchanging, you know, mild attrition in between two states could mean thousands of dead. And, and this makes you understand also much more easily what war is concretely about and why it is, you know, most of the times it's not actually a good option uh, in practice, but how acceptable it is in the realm of, of 
you know, in the existential realm, meaning that there is really nothing you can do to avoid it sometimes. Uh, I'm not referring to any specific war, nor in Ukraine right now, but because everything is dramatically more complicated in, in at the collective level, but let's say that gives you the idea of the scale of how things can happen. Von Clausewitz also naturally stresses that there is always a choice, so the individual responsibility, individual will, etc. are fundamental. That's with, This is it's a an ideal thing, meaning that it really pertains why the moral dimension is more important because there is no such thing like in fact people want sometimes to justify words that you know without any real moral basis you know it's come to that or it must just be done or it's uh, unavoidable it's never unavoidable, nothing is unavoidable right because everything that is human uh, you know decided is is fr is fruit of a, of a choice right even intentionally or whatever so von Clausewitz, of course, uh, is not a moral relativist, nor I am, and so um, this just dialectically should serve to understand how, you know, what, how low certain levels of propaganda are for basically anything that pertains, like, you know, um, some outright justification of anything in the first place, but also how, of course, there is always a a specific cause, a specific reason, and, and yet this is also very complex to to perscrew in the first place, but this is yet another another aspect that is, that is important as for what we're saying right now. And so this for all this for um, stressing the importance of conflict. War is basically its violent enactment, and the two terms do not have to be confused ever. Uh, that that is inherent in humanity every single level right so this is why even if you understand if you know some proverb from i don't know the ancient latin proverbs like vivere militare est or other thing and you really start as understanding why you know the idea of struggle of psychomachia let's say of this idea that there is a you know a, a, a struggle between good and evil within within man and how this reflects in the world etc is already very spot on, right, in, in the mythology of these peoples, in the culture of these peoples, um, to to understand what is actually a biological reality, right, that doesn't need, again, uh, a knowledge of advanced bio modern biology to, to realize how uh, it takes place in reality. This is extremely important, again, as we were saying before, in the sense that how much we have forgotten and how much we have pretended erroneously that the only way to explain complex uh, phenomena is just, you know, you have to explain how this thing works materially, right? There is nothing to do with that. Just study history, right? You will not necessarily understand much materially in the sense that you don't have to be in a war in order to understand how it actually works. I mean, this is yet another... Uh, principle that is against the em the emotionalism, the irrationality that, in fact, the same in the European mythology was stressing as a sense that that war, as von Clausewitz says as well, um, ba basically in relative terms, the single most important ca in quality is reason. Right? It, you can't win war with reason alone, and this is yet another point we will see now. But fundamentally, there is no such thing like the um you know uh, emotionalistic approach to war that we have been um uh, essentially presented exclusively with ever since you know i can't remember in my lifetime at least you know from school from the media for whatever uh, war is not a matter of being properly understood in a rational sense but just saying you know uh, expressing a moralistic judgment on it or that you know in this sense uh, getting ever more far away from any kind of scientific understanding of reality, right? Which instead, again, ancient peoples, even without modern science, had perfectly understood. And a part, great part of the reason, of course, is that fortunately, we're just not, we are exposed directly to war at large. Um, and the uh, and uh, the world has changed in a way to, to give us complexively uh, the possibility of just living mostly of theory, rather than practice. 100 years ago, it was the contrary, right? Most people had a practical intelligence uh, as opposed to a theoretical one because fewer people needed that. Today, the uh, um, ratio has been switched. So it's obvious that the, you know, if you don't, it's a brutal change, right? And this is also practically not acknowledged in its implications. 
as far as I see around, even regarding to this topic, so that people are much, especially with a very poor education, like the one that we generally speaking have, to, in order to frame uh, complex problems and try to, to analyze them that we, we get through our Mandarin education, um, the, the average person just doesn't have the tools to, to, to appreciate, right, or to even to pose a, as a problem, because again, it's, it's if anything, um, you know, it would be pure speculation for them, and or they, they wouldn't have any connection with that in the first place. Um, I will n also not digress on the difference between, let's say, how much theory and practice intertwine, because it's still, they are, to make the long story short, they're both necessary. Exper direct experience is more important. There are rare cases in which just a very solid theoretical build-up is enough to be, you know, um, is enough for for example, for command in a way, but it's it's rare, it's infrequent, you need practice. And in the absence of practice, still, however, you should study what reality has been, right? So not speculation, but again, what has happened in history, in the, in the real past. And that's the reason why studying military history in a diachronic and comparative sense is the only way to understand basically anything about war. Um, without that, you can even be on the front line basically not understanding anything about how things really work, uh, and, and, and I'm extremely serious about this, because this is the, the truth, unfortunately, um, uh, or fortunately in a way, because it's a great option in potential, it's just that not many people really follow it. Um, being there in the field, naturally, to take a, to take command is a very different thing, right, there is a huge difference, as you know, in of it's in theory, it's very well explained between voice in command and, and the average trooper, because here, again, we're not talking about the emotionalistic thing. What you see in the front line is horrifying, you see, you know, you, you're scared, you're freaking out, whatever, but the, the wall hierarchy in, in, the, in the military is built in, in, in a way that ideally, through a meritocratic, uh, you know, criterion, to, to the top should raise pe those people that are capable of maintaining cold blood, essentially. Um, steady nerves in front of the the dramatic moral pressure that that is in war right and especially that in positions of command is much larger than the one of, of the soldier in the front line even maybe if the general is you know in, in the rear um, uh, lines as uh, the responsibility that falls on the guy even just properly from a political and social point of view again that, that these are other the, the, the two elements that are constantly connected to war and without which war cannot be fought, meaning that there is not, uh, like categorically, there is a military dimension, but uh, it doesn't exist in reality without, without a political social film. And the, the same soldier is a person who, with a political idea, it comes from a certain social reality, and um, is, is a soldier who is fighting, so it pertains to the military. And, and so without motivation, without values, without whatever the background is, and so like here the ideal side of the story, uh, you cannot fundamentally understand anything about how wars are fought. So the centrality of the struggle um, emerges from the Clausewitzian work that, uh, as you know if you have studied it, doesn't quite talk about anything but war, right? Uh, but explains you in a physical sense how uh, from a strictly you know from meaning in terms of the hard signs how human existence is wired entirely to this thing right so how in, in, in humanity again uh, conflict violence and struggle are constantly present in every single instant of a person's existence as much as the political element the, the social element that correspond Again, they are all inter all the three are the, the the wonderful trinity, as von Clausewitz calls it. We will revisit it now to explain the analogies with Indo-European mythology, but um, they they all exist per se, right? There is not a moment in which, you know, uh, I don't know, there is just war and then politics switches off. This is especially the the, the greatest mistake you could make in Clausewitz in theory in the first place. Uh, there is no um, thus no way to mechanize in a secularistic or modernistic sense this idea because um, uh, like I don't know Yom and Eve would have done that eventually you know said von Clausewitz was right instead so that von Clausewitz was perfectly aware that you cannot fundamentally anatomically dissect something like war or the same existence by pretending to write a manual to 
of what to do in every single situation because it will not work and you have to rely on this incredible incredible mental capacities that we have that fundamentally we don't need to know how where even it, where it stems from because in the moment in which we are trying to speculate on where lives come from we are still uh, on earth trying to you know win wars right and if you want to win wars we should if anything understand what what war uh, is and and we cannot speculate we have to realize what we have at our disposal what we can understand with our mind in a realistic concrete way in time right von clausewitz now we will read a passage from the uh, sixth chapter of the third book that we've already commented in my series on the von krieg but that is extremely close because it, it, it's a, it's a, exactly the point it's it's the only passage in which von clausewitz resorts to the word hero which surprisingly enough is the world point of the indo-european uh, mythology and explains basically the same dynamic of that indo-european struggle uh, that is fundamentally also a holy war because there is fundamentally in in the in the search for the truth in this regard uh, there is of course a, a sacred value the the utmost value that those peoples properly spotted in 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 the in the idea of of controlling yourself right or being able to in 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 the toughest as we have seen of of uh, human uh, situation that that is war in terms of what you can do about it at least to to control it the great the the, perp, the ultimate purpose of life and this evidently even if you just know and if you follow the series of on on medieval knighthood and how this this world the world pagan idea also blended with the christian one etc this idea of the psychomachy or the the, the 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 struggle between between good and evil etc is the universal human condition in every single given moment doesn't matter whether it takes a violent form like in a brawl or in a world war uh, or if whether it's just internal basically our entire life is exclusively about this and objectively this is impossible to deny because it's literally what what we're doing and, and the way we are motivated and uh, Cla the clause of its in trinity fundamentally explains this uh, to us now i uh, i would start from from the clause of its in trinity meaning that uh, uh, now I will draw the parallelisms with the uh, with the Indo-European mythology. So, the Clausewitzian Trinity is um, this um, uh, incredible mm, combination of three factors that, as we've seen, never never come less right in somebody's existence. And in war, they are fundamentally excited to the utmost, right? Or at least they are required. The utmost, right? And this is exactly again what the in the European mythology actually stresses. Um, so the first one is the primordial violence, uh, hatred, enmity, right? That von Clausewitz tells us ha uh, have to be considered as a blind natural force. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is a crucial thing because in the um, so the, this first element, so primordial violence, hatred, enmity, as you understand, is first of all somewhat the closest we have to to a blind natural force. Really, uh, even if you compare it to 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 the one of other animals, right? It's this. It has nothing uh, in terms of reason, of, of science, etc. We just feel that is an instinct, and in the clause of its in Trinity, this first element corresponds to the people. Right, in the, the Trinity has these, the, as we've seen, the, the politics, military, and and the people. Right, so it would be politics, military, and so social, political, military, and social the dimension, respectively. Now, in the Indo-European religions, as we've seen, this blind force is connected all over. We're talking about the Hellenic, the Germanic, the the Italic, the the Vedic religions they are all basically telling us that this blind primordial element is the unruly barbaric tonic inferior dark dionysian the the ubers right you know it's it belongs to the underworld it belongs to the darkness it belongs to the night it belongs to the to the lack of light lack of clarity lack of reason this pertained to the so-called pelasgian peoples to the pre-indo-european peoples that the indo-europeans came to rule on 
right? Indo-Europeans basically being this militarized population from the semi-nomadic steppe um, uh, north of the Caucasus, more or less in today's Ukraine, I think about Kurganic culture and so on, that um, eventually swarmed into, not, not just West, in fact, we talk about Indo-Europeans because some went East, uh, took over India, that's the Vedic um, thing, it, they, they were brutal. Right, that's where, from which the Hindu castes basically are on. Right, the idea that it was a, a, a firm hierarchy of this virile, uh, masculine loaded, let's say, uh, light oriented, uranic, militarized rulers that would dominate the feminine, el tonic, agricultural element of, of these peoples that were s sedentary and much more connected, in fact, to the idea of fertility, of this like, the agrarian cycles they were much more fatalistically oriented differently from the Europeans that instead stressed the idea of individual action, right? And uh, because they, they thought that there was no survival after death, that their souls and bodies would have been swallowed and, and uh, devoured by the, the dark, the demons of the underworld, by which they, they were obsessed and they feared to be contaminated also by blood, etc. So they were kind of morally weaker, let's say less um, crafty in the sense of, let's say, at least in terms of uh, political military initiative, right? In sake of command, a moral force needed to do that, that instead the semi nomadic tribes of the North had. So in, in many ways, they, th this is the division, right? So this first element of the Clausewitzian Trinity unavoidably corresponds to the ectonic forces, right? To the giants in the Nordic uh, Germanic uh, mythology that are brought down by the Azi, that are the here, the celestial heroes, um, the uh, the titans in the Hellenic mythology that the, the 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 Olympic gods managed to crush. This is present everywhere, right? This is present in all the sagas about the Roman conquest of Italy that submit all the various kind of basically ketonic, uh you know communities that were around, while the Romans venerated the utmost uh, celestial glory of the uh, of Jupiter, um, of the eagle, and all these things. Uh, in other words, this primordial force, you would say, but that then doesn't it doesn't belong to in the in the Europeans. Well really not, because let's say this negative force is present as we've seen in all of us. Right? So this is not just the historicistic idea of of course this uh, masculine feminine dichotomy, the reason versus uh, emotion, all these things. It's, it, it, it was present within the same in the Europeans. It was present within the same, not just the sexual dichotomies of men and women, but it was present literally between, I don't know, the, the, the strong and the coward. Those who were, in fact, struggling and competing constantly for achieving the, the heroism and hence victory that came from the skies, essentially, as a blessing of the of the deity for the the hero was perfectly you know clear reasonable strong devoid of the of emotionalism of anything so in the um video i made also on this uh on the in the european doctrine of holy war we have seen fundamentally that the hero we've seen it from aruna we have seen it from the uh, you know from the valkyries etc how in the uh uh, say in the, in the European process of transfigur heroic transfiguration, what happened within the warrior was that he needed to evoke necessarily in order to achieve that degree of uh, emotionless uh, um, of lack of emotion that would just make him pure reason and action, as opposed to this more you know the more irrational element, had to revive from within, within himself, from within his instinct, his natural dimension, the, properly the corporate bodily one, the most violent, primordial violence, hatred, enmity, right? And the greatest victory of all in the, in the European tradition was to tame this uh, horrifying nature of yours, the dark side of you. Right. If you manage to dominate your dark side and to tame it, the same dark side, because of the primordial violence, in fact, so violence that you need to fight, would transfigure itself in basically what is our guardian angel, that is basically the same thing of the Valkyries, it's the same thing of this winged um, uh, glory as a female figure that eventually is the same glory, that is basically a, a kind of an alter ego at that point of the hero's uh, of the hero as um, as his soul fundamentally that eventually will 
accompany him back to the sky. So what is fundamental here is that the ultimate purpose of the Indo-European ethics is to tame your your own dark force, to transform it yourself, to commit this, to, to achieve this transfiguration of your own soul into the heroic, perfect, essentially divine one, right? Because the ultimate goal here was to, the Valkyries, this, this winged furies, uh, etc., that, that are so present, in fact, among the dictonic element that the Indo-Europeans weren't to tame in the mythologies, eventually were transfigured by the same warrior hero at that point into, into glory itself and achieving victory. So this is actually a, a great metaphor also of, of the, the, the concept of the rape of the heavenly maiden, maiden the idea that this Indo-European warriors, as you know, this is very present in many cultures of those tribal, the, the idea of the, the war bands that went every spring to fight against other tr uh, uh, tribes and uh, killing the men and getting the women. And these women symbolized, in fact, the ectonic element, both from the fact that, no, let's say, th these women belong to another tribe that was conceived as, let's say, inferior to to yours because it was the ketonic one if, if it lost by the way if it won it was superior to you instead that's how they they balance the thing out and plus they were women so they lacked the masculine element and so on but the point was essentially after having killed the men to get the women think about the rape of the sabines and the foundation of rome all this thing um and to for these women to recognize your superiority over their killed men. So these women, in fact, in, in, the, in the myth of the Sabines, the, the, the Sabines accept that they had become Roman wives so that they don't want to come back from the Sabines who had escaped and wanted to come back negotiating, etc. because they said, these are the best warriors, these are the best men. And so these women had been elevated by the same warrior, in that sense, as the prize, right? Also the the, the whole idea of the virgins in heaven, this, uh, this thing that even permeated Islam at some point because they took all of that from, the, the, basically it was the, the holy, Islamic holy war is, is basically a copy of the, of the Persian one, of the, of the Persian, yeah, of the, the one of the Zoroastrianism, um, etc. From, from the, from the Indo-European tradition it was completely the same thing, it was essentially this idea that this fury, this, um, uh, let's say, oppositional force of darkness, of feminine kind of emotionalistic side, would be kind of transfigured by, by the hero's superiority and one as the perfect woman that eventually had to breed another generation of warriors. Um, this is a radically important message because von Clausewitz puts, first of all, this primordial violence hatred and enmity as blind uh, natural force as the first element of the trinity not not surprisingly because it corresponds to the people right so the people represents of course in uh, not just in the age of mass warfare like the clausewitz and one napoleonic times was being triggered but probably in the wall communitarian dimension also the Ro you know i'm thinking about, about the roman case because that that's um, I, I made a video about that on the moral superiority of Roman civilization. It explains exactly what, how Rome achieved military superiority by exactly unlocking the forces of the chronic masses that, they, that the, the padres, the, in, allegedly the, the, the Indo-European descendants that made up the, the Senate and therefore the feudal military caste managed to frame these people within a, uh, and therefore elevating them, right, and transfiguring them in the world's conquerors by disciplining this primordial um, force into a rational, clear one, right? The entire Roman sagas tell you the same old story, that the Romans prayed st this, this kind of violence and strength, etc., but only when it was framed under, uh, um, under a rational and brutal discipline. No things could exist. Uh, the two thing, without the two things, uh, nothing could happen. In fact, we will see it. Uh, in von Clausewitz, it says exactly the same thing, that you cannot have just pure rational discipline, um, pure reason to win a war. You need the virtus, let's say, that um, needs to be bent to reason, right? Virtus is not the secularized, modernized concept that we have made of virtue. For the Romans, the virtus was exactly this virility in the utmost 
ancestral radical uh, Indo-European sense. So this idea of actually brutal warriorism that had that was appreciated individually, but had to be bent by the equally and dramatically much more ferociously and traumatically violent Roman discipline that allowed the legions to take over the world. Um, so this was seen in, in, in Roman mindset and civilization as the greatest possible achievement, as it was recognized by all the other peoples, in fact, in the same thing, that the Romans had taken over the world. And, and, and the whole m military religious beliefs at the time were universally among every people the same so having conquered world was by itself the declaration that god the gods had literally rewarded the greatest right the, there is all this in the in the hellenic historiography that eventually told us about the roman conquest of, of the world um there is there are so many different references it, it, it's very interesting by the way that the classical greeks that instead were not that were not really warriors like the romans were citizen soldiers despised in a sense this mm, uh let's say warrioristic dimension because they said that's that's a barbarian thing and so they they act absolutize in a sense virtue in in uh, they, they absolutize reason in a kind of a theoretical form uh, this is there is a beautiful passage by Thucydides in this sense in, in the Peloponnesian war uh, where discipline is praised more than else you know think about uh, Athena that is the same goddess of war in the in the reasonable sense as opposed to ours that is the warrioristic thing and of course Athena always wins and that's comes in that comes in the Hellenic mythology exactly from the same uh, Indo-European background but let's say the Greeks had somewhat idealized too much in the sense that they they didn't want actually to fight right in, on a regular basis with the, the usual exception of the Spartans and instead had that constant discipline and also this idea of a caste properly that ruled over the slaves that reflected a bit more that sacrally oriented idea of war uh, of the Indo-European origin and that f from which in fact great part of their military superiority in Greece stemmed from uh, but that when fighting as a much more warlike people like the Romans like the, the you know the, the Italic uh, the Roman and Italic Confederation etc you know, succumbed because they were s somewhat too much secularized and modernized, right, and hadn't stressed so, in such a radically uh, stoic dimension, uh, what, you know, probably the, the necessity of, of, of becoming a hero was, like in the Roman tradition. The, the, it's not a surprise that Stoicism, that was even within Elen the mature classical Hellenic philosophy, was kind of a, a you know, attempt to to counter rationalism, speculation, let's say the excesses of intellectualism was so much uh, successful in, in Rome because it uh, expressed those ideas of apatheia, as Zeno Valer was saying, that as probably is the absence of emotions in the moment in which you have to act purely. And this idea of pure action as, uh, as the, the ultimate goal of of anybody like that of course is to get it's unavoidably about the idea of truth it's, it's an asymptotic idea about the universe of the infinity is unavoidably sacral right without faith uh, the the roman fetus you cannot achieve anything in that regard that is to say you cannot take as we will see now any risk right in, as in the second element of the trinity that is determination that is what from closet says without that you can't really basically do anything in war um, and that um, um, is, um, uh, is, in fact, it's here it's all the base, that the, if you lack the, agree, uh, the idea of sacrality, you can fundamentally understand anything about this world system anymore. And so that's why sec secularism um, has basically brought us to say, what the hell is this all about? Because we have fundamentally lost the understanding of why it is. In, in, in such d dire straits like that could happen like in a war that we're not exposed anymore directly at large uh, we we can't even understand how necessary sacredness b uh, faith actually are and why the the ancient peoples all used it um, there was absolutely no kind of difference whatsoever in the essence of it between paganism and monotheism this this is also modernistic and pag uh, and uh, sec uh, secularistic um, 
delusion that some liberal decided at some point that monotheism arrived and canceled what, what existed before it. This is a radical uh, illiteracy in any uh, elementary notion of, of history of religions. And, and yet, basically, this is the, the, the mainstream thought on, on the topic uh, as, a main, uh, as, a, as a matter of fact. So, the first element of the Trinity, the people, the plebs, is the ketonic element. Right, so in theory, the, the, this, this is particularly important because culturalism, for example, that dominates m modern, say, uh, military academies, denies this fact because, of course, culturalists are, are radically underschooled ignorance, uh, starting from Kagan, from anybody who you know criticizes von Clausewitz without even having literally opened the book, because I can swear that he never did, um, and. Um, uh, that uh, believes that culture is just you know uh, the the elevated people is incapable you know doesn't recur to violence right you know normal people just if you leave them by themselves if they're not led by brutes do not make war as a matter of fact history shows us dramatically well how in fact the the most blind radical violence is properly the one of the people of the angry mobs of the masses that are by far the most viciously and senselessly and disgustingly violent elements of, of, of the entire group, right? And we are all part of it, meaning that, again, in the Trinity, there's not like a people just, you know, separated from other elites, but tendentially, right, the more the down you go, the, the more down you go in the mass, the more you find that, right? So this is evident in anything about all the, re the mass revolutions, all what even properly, even think about Rome, what the plebs did, or even in the Nordic mythology, how the giants, this this figures that and come always, even as a threatening force at the end of times when the Asgard will be assaulted and gods will die, uh, that are tamed, yes, by the conquerors, but they are always a looming threat because it's always this dumb mass that, you know, is just big, strong, but stupid fundamentally. And so this this is the only idea. And in fact, very, very frequently, ethnonationalists nationalists today that, of course, know nothing about this, that their own you know, what they think is their own tra tradition. Of course, they don't know even what it is. Identify instead the model with the brute, with the strong, with the force. And of course, they do not even understand that in the Germanic um, uh, dimension, of course, it's the Wiesels, is properly the intelligent person, the rational person who prevails over brute force. That's why the uh, the medium of, of the celestial day of the sky is, of, of war is, um, is, uh, is, is Odin was a grizzled veteran, not Thor, that is the, you know, the wild young man, or is also still a hero of the, let's say, of the Olympic pantheon of the Nordic mythology, but still is the guy who, who succumbs, like, uh, like Ares does in front of Athena, right? There is no match between him and, 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 and Vodan in, this, in the same way. Naturally, there are slight differences in, in the various in the European uh, mythologies, but they just correspond to differences sta at different stages of development between those peoples, but not really in, in the essence of the meaning, right? The Greeks and the Romans had gone a bit beyond in the separation of certain um, uh, deities that had uh, conceptualized better to distinguish the function, but whereas, I don't know, the uh, the 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 Norse were somewhat had a kind of a more primitive idea of the world, but it, it it doesn't you know change practically what the meanings are. Actually, you cannot understand anything about any of these individual mythologies if you don't compare them to one another, right? There's no such thing like understanding any of uh, Norse or Roman or Hellenic or Vedic religion if you don't actually study among each other, right? They, they have completely, like, they would have a sense on their own, but uh, there is no such thing like studying them without knowing the others, which is another thing that, unfortunately, from an ethno-nationalistic point of view, is is con constantly done. Uh, I wonder if any person even knows that there are Roman sagas of what they are and how fame more, you know, you know, precious in a sense they are considering the times and places compared to, to what we have you know about later peoples. In any case, um, uh, the um, the second element of the Trinity in Klausowitzian theory is a uh, game, really the game, and uh, the game of chance and of probabilities within which the creative spirit is uh, free to, to roam. This second element of the Clausewitzian trinity uh, corresponds to the military, right? Corresponds to the military in as much as we know 
uh, that of course uh, no uh, like there, nobody has the certainty how war will go there are basically just some odds right it's like rolling the dice it can be better or uh, odds or worse odds um, it's a probability but you cannot know how to, it will be because the the system is too complex our neurocognitive capacity is impossible you know is is in, is incapable of course of of framing reality uh, or sorting things out to predict them, right? We can have a kind of an idea on the base of experience, of uh, practice, and so on. We can draw probabilities, but it's never like the outcome in war is never what you thought, and more than any, any other human activity and that you can control in relative terms, as a matter of fact. So, um, this aspect is um, the one that I would say the uh, the Indo European mythology just expresses in the, in the fact that it was a military. Um, a military religion, right? Like basically all religions at the time. These heroes were always, uh, I mean, if you read the the sagas, you know that uh, there is always kind of a looming threat. There is, think about even especially the Germanic ones, that there is always this tragic um, destiny of the hero in a way that there is always a sense of, um, you know, of threat, of vulnerability, of... Um, of, of, of small things that can cause big things. This is all part of also the same Clausewitzian theory about uh, friction, uh, the fog of war, and so on. And so the idea is that the military, per se, is the element that is more bound, attracted to the um, to chance, right? It, it corresponds to the action, as a matter of fact. And, and this, neurocognitively speaking, this seems to be exactly the case because it turns out that human beings are not attracted by peace and serenity and stability. They are attracted to the unknown, to things that they want to make sense and sort out. So um, going out there and taking a risk is the only way for elevating yourself, by the way, because it's um, the, the moment, as we have seen, uh, of greatest threat, of greatest danger that uh, will, uh, as we'll see now eventually in the, in the passage we quote for from Clausewitz, but it's expressed in the Indo-European religion, that is the only... Um, is the only aim of the um, uh, of of the war fundamentally? Uh, so that's how Varuna is told before the battle that he would, when he fears and says, you know, what what happens here because he's torn apart also morally. Do I go to war? What what will happen? And and the same um, that same soul, that same glory tells him, the uh, the goddess tell, tells him that you know what. What do you care about? Like, if you if you if you win, you will be conqueror of the world. If you die, you will go to heaven. So just fight, right? This was the mentality that that stood at, at at the root of the also the Vedic religion, as you know, is probably this, the single most hardcore one in terms of properly coming straight and from w without diversion from the Aryan spring uh, of the origins. That uh, because it's much more ancient, as a matter of fact, as you know, the Veda didn't even leave an archaeological trace. But in the in the Indo tradition, th this stuff is extremely, you know, the sheer power, the, the how it survived through the millennia, is, it tells you that the radical moral moral impact that this had in in Indian in in the Indian world, and um, and so there is an, an attraction towards probably risk and 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 and. Who can deny that, right? How don't we like to know uh, how things will go, right? Even if they may go bad, right? But we want to know. And this this is what brings us to act and to fight in that sense. Um, and so, as we've seen, in, in war is the elected place where your... Um, your capacity to improve, to tame the the, the blind element of yourself in, in a in a reason in a Apollonian fashion, of clarity and confidence and and, and self control, um, will elevate you and uh, and so in this sense war is a big game, right? Von Clausewitz says that war is is a game both objectively and subjectively, um, also especially because of this uh, random chance of these odds of these stakes, and um, and objectively, we like it in that regard, uh, which is terrifying. But it, it's basically nature telling us that if, if we want to survive in anything, we have to take a risk. That there is no su such thing like accomplishing anything without risking something, right? And so, this I think is a very important message because it, in, in today's world, we want to basically aseptize, like to sterilize everything, right? You know, do things that are always good. There is always a good. Uh, there is always. Uh, you know the the, the mm, you know the explanation of how you will you can succeed 
and then people keep uh, not succeeding or taking ever less risk and keeping their world smaller and smaller and being frightened by responsibility and just involving uh, with on, on themselves um of course uh we should teach children that you cannot achieve anything if you don't accept that you can't fail and fail entails pain and suffering and loss right and in order to educate people we must make them understand that war is about suffering it's about pain it's about loss right and it ends badly for everybody right just to spoil you the the, the ultimate end so that it's the what you do in life indeed that that has the the utmost value that you can prove towards the infinite and and therefore elevate yourself towards the truth and to, towards that uh, magnification let's say of of of, uh, of your own possibilities that are potentially within us as the the first element of of tonic nature so the darkest and most uh, object one can be properly worked on by yourself to actually make make you being brought by uh, by by the same to to heaven the third uh, element of the trinity uh is the um let's say the element of subordination of war as instrument of politics that renders w war properly object of pure reason this is arguably the most important element of the trinity because in, in, in a qualitative sense because without reason you cannot fundamentally and so we're talking about knowledge uh, and uh, properly making sense of the word from a scientific sense you can't go nowhere right you there, there is no way to uh, to dominate your inner demons if you're not a r reasonable person if you not if you do not mature this through knowledge, through properly a, a large amount of information that you must be able to build up correctly in order to be a functional human being in, 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 in reality, but to the point of having to manage even something so, so, so big like, like war. And that comes from politics. Politics here is the properly the agent. War is just an instrument of politics, and therefore what, what uh, this... The, the, the Trinity is telling us that primordial violence must be dominated by reason, which is exactly what, uh, as we've seen, the uh, heroic divine transfiguration of the Indo-European warrior hero uh, is about. So in other words, in the way the, uh, the, 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 the Clausewitzian subordination of war to politics is the same Indo-European subordination of the inner demons to the Apollonian uh, ideal of the light and this is unavoidable to understand right and the the third element of the Trinity corresponds to government in spite of uh, th the same reason why there are so many populists and people who think that I don't know there are just tyrants and the rest of the people are good are exactly part of the first element of the tonic masses that do not understand anything because of course the government is just a reflection of the same people in a way but it's the most rational element of the world community right governments know how to take care of things better than than the average person because they habitually take care of the whole freaking system that is enormously, enor enormously more complex than what the average person normally handles every day and uh, I think there is no doubt about this so if you complain for the fact that your politicians suck that actually depends on the fact that your people suck uh, and that, that there is a, a perfectly direct and di proportionally direct um, relation between the two things there is no such thing like a stupid government w uh, without a stupid people one are all the uh, reflection of the other uh, and uh, and it's always the people's fault whatever the government does right this is also just to to leave any r more disgusting moral relativism aside by saying ah it's all the politicians fault which is exactly what is being shown even in the propaganda russian propaganda in ukraine right it's the typical soviet post-socialist delusion that it's the terrible politician so that you can't keep the people unaware of what the hell is going on uh better in in that fashion uh that's one of the first indicator of of inferiority in the 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 ectonic uh, emotionalistic feminine elements of the masses and that there is no surprise that so many people today buy in this bullshit because that's exactly what they are um 
and government instead is at least the, the most enlightened element of the of the community because it, it takes the one that takes the direction say to takes the decisions and it's crucial because all this is also the judeo-christian tradition tells us that we sin in mind not in action right action is just physical what brings to action is the decision and so everybody who has studied the Clausewitz in theory knows how much emphasis von Clausewitz puts on the uh, on the concept of decision and how this is uh, basically the single most important thing in the uh, in the game um, what is fundamental for von Clausewitz in this sense and so explaining the Trinity is that this idea of people military and government is actually not uh, just as we've seen uh, a collective thing it, it also r has to do with the individual right remember the dual on a large, large scale you all these things are happening within you at the same time so you have reason to tame your to let's say to channel your primordial instincts to achieve what you want in this game of probability of action right it, it all comes to the point you, know, you decide you want to do something because you have a primordial need uh, that you try to rationalize to take uh, also to to formulate a decision on how what to make and then you take action this action is the the real physical action and and you will simply like how it is to to go through it and see what happens right whether it succeeds or not so this is basically the picture and as you understand from a neurocognitive point of view it's kind of elementary it's a it's an accurate depiction of what happens in everybody's minds and surprise, surprise, is exactly what the European mythology not just describes in the same way, but both it and von Clausewitz tell that basically the utmost, um, you know, goal of existence is attaining this in, in the guise of victory, right? What is in that sense that uh, it's not success, it's not an achievement, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be war even, right? But all of this mechanism serves the purpose of achieving anything in life. So the the Indo Europeans, as we've seen, brought uh, they had a very idealistic conception of this, for which of, co of course they believed that the warrior who managed to tame the the female uh, demon of of uh, you know victory could achieve victory, could possess victory herself, and therefore transmutate into a in fact a, a metaphysical state for which he would simply ascend heavens and be you know the superhero. Uh, of the situation and uh, becoming yet another god and this is also how many you know sub gods in you know in in the pagan world were actually created were actually dead uh chieftains champions etc eventually were you know object of cult at their graves and were were deified in that regard um not very different from what christianity fundamentally came uh, to to overlap with with the saints and so on the sicum machia the, the struggle between good and evil it's basically the same idea right nobody really copied it from one another it was the standard universal belief everywhere it didn't pertain to you know paganism did not exist as such as monotheism did not exist as such it was the same flow that uh you know simply kind of changed relatively up to the point for which we disregarded it uh by eliminating sacred in our uh, sacredness in our world and even you know laughing all it because of course the the the, fir the ketonic masses prevailed the fourth state prevailed with um without any quality and so on but this is yet another thing uh what uh von Clausewitz says um in regard to this absolute is basically the same von Clausewitz never talks about god fundamentally he however you know, uniquely aims at that in, in the moment in which he says, of course, that there is an absolute of any kind, right? He talks at some point about the concept of, the concept of absolute war for a scientific sake to, um, to explain that if that, um, let's say, if we were to take uh, war in consideration as this broader struggle between two, two actors, two agents whatsoever, uh, if let's say if we were to look at the logic of of the struggle from from a abstract point of view we would have essentially pure forces that immediately in a single instant clash against each other and the strongest one will prevail so if uh, the world was just made like that everything would be completely crystallized from it says that there is a, a natural world a physical world reason for which our our struggle is becomes physical it becomes mitigated by essentially 
uh, let's say, limited, let's put it in this way, by reality, meaning that there are literal obstacles in reality. And so war is waged in very, uh, you know, you know, slow ways, you know, where there, are, there is a sus suspension of the act of war, when troops have to reorganize, then eventually they march at some point, and they look at the enemy, and then they decide to go to fight. So it's something very slow, right? Because we live in a physical world, and we cannot ignore that. So Foucault is perfectly aware of that. But if, if this was just a matter of pure will, we would have just two metaphysical entities, like two gods, clashing against each other. The whole Indo-European mythology talks about this. It's basically a struggle between good and evil, properly represented by God, uh, let's say, God, group of gods, at least, you know, however, it's always the light and the darkness struggling against one another. Um, this is present every, This is present in Zoroastrianism, this is present in so many other contexts that it's, again, represent the, the Apollonian and the, and, the, and the Dionysian, uh, the, the Uranic and the Ketonic, Right, so the uh, the Asian Devani, the uh, the Olympic gods and the Titans, this is all the same mean, right? So, von Clausewitz uh, extremizes the concept by saying if war was uh, w because he, uh, for the sake of example, by stressing that war, of course, is a struggle between moral forces that reciprocally influence each other. So again, what he says, factually, is that you know the stronger the moral force, the better placed you are right in the real world and if you if if the real world did not exist it was just a pure uh, and you know pure force struggling against each other of course immediately the strongest force would would destroy the other because there is no other n no physical world to decline the possibilities of this uh, of how these forces would be deviated in a way or another so for this this concept was um you see there is a this is there is a niche and super mystic concept at the base, you, you would think, right, is the idea of pure force. Von Clausewitz says at some point, the, of course, that the best strategy possible, to make the long story short, is being as strong as possible, because the more motivated you are, and the more you will be able to make things work against the attrition of reality. So, the, the of course, this is not um, a guarantee of success, but in theory, right, if you could push your moral force to the to the infinite, that's w what you could achieve after all. And the infinite is infinite. There is an infinite distance between us and, and it. So, in th in line of principle, this is the best thing you can do in war as in life is pretending towards that infinite, right? And so, that's also this thing how it was weaponized ideologically in a way that von Clausewitz didn't mean at all. The Nazis, for example, that were allegedly, you know, following, you know, Clausewitz in theory, uh, came up with the idea of total war, so this resistance to the end, right? That in that case was also kind of, kind of dumb, uh, given what was going on in 1943 and um, and, and the etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But von Clausewitz is not uh, at that point. He says, you know. Yes, in theory you should do that. In practice it's different because it depends on the situation. First of all, the fact that war is subordinated to politics. So at that point, in 1943, the war was lost for the Axis and there was really nothing could be done. And so it would have been better to do something else if you know there hadn't been fan ideological fanatism uh, to even realize that, uh, you know, that there was a world that was a bit different between East and West. And so that even there, things could have gone differently in another realm. Von Clausewitz is, is descriptive, it's not prescriptive. It says every situation is different, you have to measure it, and of course you have to be reasonable in that. Right, so reason triumph. Also, von Clausewitz says something very important, that is that the most important quality in war, given that, as, we, as we've seen, it takes reason and courage at the same time, courage mostly being the element of the military, because it's uh, the one that uh, gambles, that rolls the dice, right? So the one that says, okay, I, I have to have guts to do it, right? Fueled, naturally motivated by that primordial hatred that I've seen of the people, like you as well, that is subordinated, however, to reason, right? To reason. And von Clausewitz says that, as we will see now, the single most important, uh, actually, it's, this is not the passage, this is said in another passage, but uh, it's connected to this, that is determination is the most important uh, uh, element in this sense and determination basically is a very is a is a couple of is a coupling of reason and courage in the guise of um, uh, having the courage of taking action on the base of your reason right of your intelligent in understanding of 
of reality. So in other words, von Claudius says in that passage, um, if you like, you can be the most intelligent person in the world and knowing perfectly what what's the best decision to uh, to to make, but if you don't have the courage, you will not ach- you will not do anything, right? So you need both, right? And that's also why the think about the Romans that said "audentes fortuna juvat," that is to say, if you don't take your chance, you basically can't be favored by by fortune in any way because you will simply uh, you know uh, give away the give up the initiative and so the enemy will also you know have uh, t- take over in in the meanwhile with a lost chance so in a way you are you are necessarily brought to to risk but you have to do it still in a way that of course is uh is based on reason and so this this makes the whole thing extremely difficult in reality because as von Clausewitz will explain now the um uh, you know we, in reality you know it, it's easy to do this when you are at the desk uh, you know starting a map comfortably and so on well, when you are in the field and you have to take this issue with that amount of extremely limited amount of time uh with you know we, you're you're overwhelmed you're you're you know, you're scared, you don't know what's going on, etc. That is a completely different uh, situation. So, I also made a video about uh, uh, the Fortuna Kaiseris that actually talks about this view of um, the, the role of luck in the in the European military ideology, uh, in the case of Caesar and the, the deity that uh, he had come to fundamentally to side in outside of the realm it's a very complex interesting things of the realm of the sacredness of the res public and all those things you can check that out made a playlist on indo-european history by the way but now i will quote um uh, the von krieger book three of strategy in general six boldness and it's just a part of it it's an excerpt um and this is it, what von Clausewitz tells us. This is the only passage in which von Clausewitz mentions uh, hero, uh, heroes and heroism in the von Krieger. And this has, uh, I've searched for it because I, I thought actually in my idea of how history brought to these ideas to be only gradually abandoned. And so by the time of von Clausewitz in 8th and 19th century Prussia, uh, I believe that much of the folklore, the beliefs, etc., were still m- much more wired and in tune to those older ideas, even after centuries of modernization and secularization. That, however, us, you know, at 200 years of distance now, we have forgotten fundamentally um, in an unforgivable way, and that may have influenced the same Clausewitz in theory. I don't know. I personally don't know how much in from Clausewitz's education that. I think critics have mostly, in, uh, say, spotted into a um, kind of, in fact, m- scientific idea, but, you know, didn't m- look much to folklore in, in something that instead, looking at eventually the Prussian reforms of the military, the parallel ideology, and uh, the myths were being revived even during Romanticism by the Green Brothers. If you read Bearskin, for example, it's an incredibly, you know, meaningful ideology that has to do with the the view of the citizens uh warrior at that point that uh the the, the Prussians were you know using as a model in the von Scharnhorst reforms of the Prussian military that eventually would uh you know win in in the wars against uh Austria and Denmark and, and especially France and would eventually bring uh, Germany on you know the rank of of, of war powers and uh all which is the moment in which the same von Clausewitz became international, because before that, in those 30 years after his death, really, I don't think there is any known translation of that, even in a foreign language. So this is radically important for for any kind of civilizational level that you can imagine. Von Clausewitz says, quote, the higher we rise in a position of command, the more the mind understanding and penetration predominate in activity the more therefore is boldness which is a property of the feelings kept in subjection and and for that reason we find it so rarely in the highest positions but then so much the more should it be admired boldness directed by an overruling intelligence is the stamp of the hero 
This boldness does not consist in bantering directly against the nature of things, in a downright contempt of the laws of probability, but if a choice is once made in the rigorous adherence to that higher calculation which genius, the tact of judgment, has gone over with the speed of lightning. The more boldness lends wings to the mind and the discernment, so much the farther they will reach in their flight, so much the more comprehensive will be the view, the more exact the result, but certainly always in the sense that with greater objects greater dangers are connected. The ordinary man, not to speak of the weak and irresolute, arrives at an exact result, so far as such is possible, without ocular demonstration, at most after diligent reflection in his chamber, at a distance from the danger and responsibility. Let danger and responsibility draw close round him in every direction, then he loses the power of comprehensive vision, and if he retains this in, the me in any measure by the influence of others, still he will lose his power of decision, because in that point no one can help him. This is a, a beautiful passage. So, what we look at here, first of all, the higher we rise in a position of command, the more of the mind, understanding and penetration predominate in activity, the more therefore is boldness, which is the property of the feelings kept in subjection, and for that reason we find uh, it so rarely in the highest positions, but then so much the more should it be admired. So, this is a, a radically important thing, because remember what I said about Voden before, that the, the actual model of kingship of that is of course in which the one in which the Indo-European sacrality substantiates itself in as a leader of freemen, you know, free warriors, is um so here in a position of command in the highest re level is uh, normally a, a reasonable one. Right? So it do it doesn't hack act harshly or boldly. But still von Clausewitz says it is exactly when that mind is capable to, un to understand that taking the risk is, can be the most profitable situation because he realizes that, that by delaying fundamentally would be even worse later on and acts immediately without, without um, you know, with the proper understanding, the proper certainty and so with the proper competence, right? Um, taking that risk coldly, right? Having calculated accurately without when this is the you know, this should be really admired, which doesn't happen among the highest spheres, because normally these people, yes, they may have a good judgment, etc., but they're part of, a, of something big, and so the responsibility, right, and the, and the danger are so big that would make uh, even such great minds, you know, cautious, and very often overly so. So here's the point. Boldness directed by an overruling intelligence is the stamp of the hero. In other words, this is saying we all know, actually, like the, we all know really what's the best option all the time. The point is that we don't take that, right? Realize it about your own life. It's not that you don't do great things because you actually don't know how much better you could, you could be. Right, you don't know what it would be to the infinite, of course, and that's why the Indo-Europeans thought of divine transfiguration. This is also what, in a sense, also the Judeo-Christian tradition maintained, and so many others. The point is that you don't do it because you're fundamentally lazy. You're not bold. You say, but you know, now I don't vote. Maybe things will go worse, but why care? Instead, I, I maintain temporary stability. Temporary, and instead, things go wrong in the meanwhile. Instead. If you're capable of realizing that the only way out of a situation is acting with, you know, taking big risk or responsibility, but it's at least having done it in a reasonable way so that you consider that the odds, after all, at that point were more favorable than they would have been at, at any other time had you hesitated otherwise, is really the stamp of the hero, right? Doing something incredibly risky, but still as the best choice because it's, the most reasonable thing to do is taking all that responsibility on yourself in front of danger, still acting. That is the true stamp of the hero. This is the only time von Clausewitz uses the term hero in the work. This is incredibly important because von Clausewitz, again, talks a lot about the moral dimension and he never uses the term anywhere else. So the fact that he does in in uh, in speaking of boldness, that as we were saying before, even with from Latin proverbs and this idea of, you know, 
of, of uh, this quality of the hero or you know, if I think about the Germanic warriors, the knights, etc is is there right and we often don't understand it we often think that boldness is just you know that's what young people harshly do right this is what they harshly do because they lack understanding right so, so here it's not about again about being bold but as we were saying before being determined that is to say being intelligent and reasonable and calm maintaining control and realizing that acting that apparently recklessly is maybe the best choice naturally it's a constant test right for Clausewitz says this boldness does in fact does not consist in venturing directly against the nature of things this is what just stupid people do right and that's in fact courage uh, you know doesn't work by itself right people think it's just being courageous no you have to be freaking intelligent for, for Clausewitz here just talk about um, an overruling intelligence right do you do you see people mostly motivated by overruling intelligence People who try to study military history who have, you know, can't even distinguish between strategy or tactics. Sometimes I found people can't even distinguish between strategy and logistics. Just speak, oh, logistics is everything, right? You know, in, in war, right? And yeah, you, even if you study what is happening in Ukraine, the Russian army, yes, logistics sucks, but it's not the reason why they, they are sucking so bad. It's a, it's a bad strategical and, first of all, political decision. If you can't read that, yes, you're definitely not. Uh, guided by an overruling intelligence, let me tell you, it, you did the same thing that the Russian state that is going, I think Clausewitz says, uh, venturing directly against the nature of things, definitely. And the nature of things, you cannot understand the world without looking at, at it for what it is, without knowing, without, without having a real understanding, a real knowledge, right? Something big, not, you know, being just the average idiot without any competence, right? Um, so, from Clausewitz, but uh, so let's repeat this boldness does not consist in venturing directly against the nature of things in a downright contempt of the laws of probability. It is to say, oh, it's, you know, it's just a bad choice, you know, um, it's very unlikely to win. So I will simply go in. It doesn't make sense. You have first to measure that with, with the stake. So envisaging what in reality this, this odd actually means. Um, but if a choice is uh, what, uh, once made, in the rigorous adherence to that higher calculation which genius, the tact of judgment, has gone over with the speed of lightning. Right, so this idea of also of rapidity of decision, right, understanding it outright, immediately. And that's what the calculation, the higher calculation of a genius judgment, tact of judgment is, right. Seeing, having coup d'oeil, as von Clausewitz also says, you know, you, you, it's, it's impossible. This is the point of the book Clausewitz and theory cognitively speaking, that what what happens on the battlefield leaves no room for, you know, speculation or, you know, complex study and calculation, because the thing is happening in front of you, if you don't act immediately, you die. So you, you must rely with your on your brain anyway, like it's most things in life, you don't have the time to calculate everything, it's stupid, because you're losing the opportunity of, of, of uh, essentially, of, uh, of acting immediately when things are just passing by, it would take infinite time to just calculate everything. So what, what, what this um, intelligence actually means is the rapidity of the, let's say, in the balance that you can make between your in impossibility of knowledge and, and the need of acting for necessity, right? This is the real intelligence, right? It's not an abstract one. It's, no, it's, it's one of, an abstract one would just be about learning everything but without actually doing nothing. Um, this one is learning what what it takes to get the thing done, but for real, well, and knowing how to decide in this most atrociously dangerous situation. Um, and so, there are many instances in which people are simply we are doing we we are constantly trading uh, our temporary uh, let's say our long term security for a temporary one. We are getting el always weaker. Right, always more irresolute, always less resistant. Right? Yes, the, the worst could happen, but in the meanwhile, it's okay. Like like the meme with the with the dog saying everything is okay. Well, the hat, well, the bar is burning. Right? You know that that's the thing that most people are doing because they're paralyzed, they are incompetent, they are simply st stupidly in in incapable of understanding the reality around them, and they let it happen. Right? This is the story basically of contemporary man. Right? There is no no search for that kind of absolute necessity of fixing things at the moment because they are important to fix. No, it's, it's the eternal procra procrastination, 
right? Then from closet says, the more boldness lends wings to the mind and the discernment, so much the farther they will reach in their flight, so much the more comprehensive will be the view, the more exact the result, but certainly always only in the sense that with greater objects, greater dangers are connected. This is fundamental as well, because it tells you that if you have a great mind that knows a lot, right, and you are able to co uh, couple this with with boldness, knowing where, when to act, not just you will succeed temporarily, and this is what most people overlook, but in the endeavor you will have achieved, what for is here, the, the greater comprehensive view, right, the more exact result, that is to say, you will not have just achieved that and you already knew it before so you didn't gain anything, no, first of all you gained the whole freaking thing you were pursuing, but secondly, you saw in this in this dramatically dangerous move, how, what it took to do it, that up to that point you, you didn't know, and so you will have acquired an understanding that, that is constantly expanding, and this is why you have to increase that, and, and to act uh, on the base of it, because otherwise uh, it's lost. As an opportunity, you will remain exactly where you are, you will not improve yourself, you will not uh, rise to heavens in that regard. And von Clausewitz, in fact, and this does not fool us, he says, with, still, this entails, always, that greater objects uh, are connected to greater dangers. So, the whole thing here is not the happy ending of everything, actually, and that's why the hero there in the Indo-European religion is, is seen, seeing victory and this, this, this uh, transfiguration. Um, in the moment of death or being near death, so in the moment of greatest danger, in the heat of battle, right, so in, in the most confused moment, by the way, in the moment in which that, that, uh, uh, that winged uh, demon r appears, because it represents, as we've seen, the most uh, uh, tempestuous, the, 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 the most, um, you know, uh, violently emotional forces, that it, the one of fear and, ter and terror and, and, and drama that, that are unfolding all around you in, in the people butchering each other in front of your eyes and risking to die because you, only if you tame that you will be able to overcome the situation to have achieved something but that is also the moment of greatest danger so if you don't expose yourself to that danger you cannot quite attain the greater object so it's not just you know a spiritual thing like and now i will think to tame my inner demon i will be a better person if you don't face it, if you don't bring it to the utmost extremes, if you don't learn how to suffer, you cannot quite achieve anything in your life. People today are just escaping suffering, and that's why they are always weaker and ever more easily controllable. And so there is no way out of this without accepting the fact you can and you will lose at some point. Right? This is crucial, crucial, because again, if you're doing this thinking that is a shortcut, to to anything, you haven't understood anything about the world concept, right? You must suffer in order to achieve anything. Otherwise, you can't achieve anything, right? So suffering means real suffering, like the bad one, the horrifying one, the one you're driven away by. And so that's where your reason must crush that fear. If you realize that if you what you can achieve is greater than you can lose, and it's always a risk. It's not going to be the case, but the, the possibilities are open out there, right? So, think about Athena, that I that crushes Ares in every single clash because she's the goddess of reason and she is um, apathetic, almost completely at least. She knows what losses in war are in the mythology. She cries at a certain point, right? But she's also able to um, to kill without you know blinking, because that's how it's to be done. And that's why she represents, by the way, and she's the female demon of victory. She, she's a female goddess. That's ex, uh, she, I mean, she's a goddess. So you understand how deep the meaning that is the, basically Athena is the greatest symbol of reason in, in, in Western civilization. And, and she's, she's a woman and she's, she's also the goddess of war. Uh, in the process, so and and she ex inspires exactly that kind of um, 
apatheia that is necessary to achieve this, you know, by risking, but not calculating that perfectly, right? And it's extremely important that in, in Hellenic civilization that was rationally oriented, this was the, the center of the understanding, that is, that this was based still on the concept of war, right? So war also has a unavoidable civilizational making. If you don't make war, you cannot achieve anything, even as a civilization in the first place. So that's, that's, that's the reason why culturalists are fundamentally culturally underdeveloped people, because, of course, they miss the entire point entirely by, you know, any stretch of the imagination. So the, this is so, such, su this is the meaning of life. You see what it means. Um, and uh, I can't stress enough how much I think the world is going towards the other direction. We, we've always done. We, we've always done the more we have gone further away from this, and in part because we have achieved more. So that scientifically we achieved more, but at the same time we distanciated ourselves from danger. And in a way it is, you know, profitable if you could eventually you know, what you would say by staying away from danger would be reinvested to take a, a bigger gamble to, to do even more. Instead, this is not happening. So this is the history of moder modernization and secularization. A half of it is good, but without the other half, it, it, it's worthless, <laughs> right? You know, science alone without morality is worthless, right? And they, they should actually back each other and said, you know, but... Again, science is describing how something works, but understanding what you can do with that is a completely different thing. That's why we need morality in the first place. Then von Clausewitz goes on and says, The ordinary man, not to speak of the weak and irresolute, arrives at, to, uh, uh, if, this is the point, at an exact result so far as is, is possible, such as possible without ocular demonstration, at most after diligent reflection in his chamber, at distance from danger and responsibility. So it's easy to do that if you don't take responsibility. We can we can all relate. When we are scared, we say, "Damn, you know, we should have acted before. We should have done something." And then you know, danger fades and say, "Okay, oh well, okay, well I can kind of go back because you know this was just temporary. I don't have to to fix the causes of why it happened." Right? This is exactly what we are fatalistically becoming. To say somebody else will work will save us for it, glued to a screen waiting for the news, but really doing nothing in person. This is exactly what the Pelasgians, pre-Indo-European people, were were criticized with and presented like a culturally inferior model by Indo-Europeans by saying you just you know don't act you you forgot how to act you forgot how what it takes to do it and thus you will hope that some random thing will make it work on your own but it falls out of yourself and so you're lost you're empty you're dead inside you have no moral force. And in fact, for close, it says, let the danger and responsibility draw closer, uh, close round him in every direction. Like he's talking about war. Then he loses the power of comprehensive, uh, not only in just war, but literally everything that can puzzle the person in the moment. Then he loses the power of comprehensive vision. And if he retains this in any measure by the influence of others, still he will lose his power of decision because in that point, no one can help him. Right, so... This is a great uh, strike to intellectualism that also must make us reflect that, indeed, talking about these things means also having to do them, right? And uh, it, 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 it's, um, it's for everybody such an enormous trial and test, that is to say, how much you're willing to, to lose, to endanger, let's say, to risk for, for, for achieving something. What, what is your ultimate goal in life? How... What is the price that you give to your own life? What do you think that you will be doing, right? You know, uh, it, it's, um, it's an incredible, incredibly difficult situation that we have to come to terms with because this is what entire life is about. Why, this is why this is not a culturalistic meaning. This is a universal meaning. This doesn't change whether we talk about one people or another, culture or another. This is the entire human experience. And it doesn't change in its essence. And that's why also the Clausewitzian theory is, is so deeply misunderstood because people are so focused about the finding the differences that they have in their hyper-specialization lost any comprehensive capacity of understanding. And understanding in this sense the pressure and the responsibility that derives from that, from that realization, from that acknowledgement. This is the main problem. Problem. I, I argue that the greatest problem in, in our world, 
um, and just making an effort like I could do by myself, being able to link these two thoughts and saying, look, that maybe some traditional and scientific uh, pillars of, of, of Western civilization actually are telling us pretty openly what, what the actual meaning of life is, and we are simply just roaming around supposing that these things do not even exist or that they are too difficult to understand, while I can explain them banally, in essence, in, in you know, some, you know, a video like this, like, like, what, what price do you give to it, again? Uh, and I'm sure that this video will not be watched by, you know, if not my, my regular followers, and they will just pile up with the sayers of others, because, again, if other people do not realize the meaning of this in perspective, by scale, comparatively, it's like words to the wind, because they have already lost, as von Clausewitz says. And so it's, um, it's a call to uh, to responsibility there's no other way to put it and we are looking at in front of our eyes of of a of a of a world situation that doesn't quite seem to be going anywhere uh, better in this regard like it, what's the are there forces in the world today that are even taking making the effort of trying to say this like even the the majority of uh, you see I, I like to hammer recently uh, also fellow conservatives because I I don't see again uh, uh, this is not a, a um, an horizontal difference this is a vertical difference this there's nothing to do with which place of the surface you are this problem is that you're on the surface you're not rising up you're not elevating yourself and so I don't really see any will to struggle anymore and, and I think that I remember some years ago a few years ago I, I was talking about how the world would end and in some ways there are much um, let's say easier ways the world could end in a way but if if assuming that everything went well in general a kind of constant progress would arrive which fortunately in a sense may not be the case um, and will not be the case. Um, the The ultimate end would be the complete lack of motivation in anything. Will be the point at which we will let ourselves die and leave by living for nothing. As and I think most people today are really already in that on that train fundamentally. I I don't see it different. Where do you talk to a person and you see you know that they really want to really improve themselves like to have a qualitative outlook on life that is not just you know some some exhibitionistic um uh, way of pretending that you know posting stuff on instagram or or uh you know just deluding yourself with strange obsessions is is fundamentally about you you can't really you can't where do you go where are you going what are your values What's what's your understanding of the sacred? There's no sacred anymore. Because in the moment in which you're not willing to die for anything, you're not willing to go through the worst for your the things you believe in at the core. Uh, at that point of what use is this human being? Like literally. Right, can't achieve some you know minor good, but in the overall in in the broader econ moral economy is 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 this person useful? Should we have this person? Because I frankly don't don't think so. Um, and I think that most of these people were of course self destroy themselves because you see even the the lack of natality rate etc. That um, um, and, and all these things and uh, broader lack of interests and achievement etc are the literally the biological extinction also of those who just you know have lost this um, this this idea so it, it's um it's an incredible problem and we will see how to um, to 
to expand even this concept further because frankly I've never told this this idea of the correspondence between the Indo-European mythology and of its interior to anybody in this comprehensive form. Um, I will be the put the one the first one to have put it out here. I also have academic means to publish stuff, so I don't care if somebody copying me or something. But um, I I've never heard of I think not even properly uh, experts talking about this stuff because mostly their their field of expertise doesn't really contemplate such apparent pindaric flights. Uh, in any case, uh, for Today, stop it here, as I think we have gotten to the point. There would be too much to add, of course, as always, but we'll keep it short for today. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And um, I thank you heartily for listening to me. And see you next time. Bye.